Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, all the peoples. How are you? I think I am not live yet. Circle's going. Oh, there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How is all the peoples? How are you doing? I am fine. Thank you. And there you come on. Yay, all our all the Wendy's are coming. Anne and Mark and Marcy and Donna and Jen and Denise and another Jen. No, the people they said not to go on and on about because they're gonna try to make a podcast out of this. But in a minute, I'll start it for real and then we will do it. How are you? I missed last week because I had an eye infection. It looked like someone had taped a ripe peach to the one side of my face. It was not attractive. In fact, I went to several doctors, saw a total of six doctors, and every time I went into a doctor's office, the the, the receptionist would go, and what are you? Oh, your eye! So, yeah, it wasn't the best thing for broadcasting, and I'm so grateful that you're back, and I'm back, and we're back. So, let's start right out. Um, welcome, welcome, everybody. This is The Gathering Room. It's November 15th, 2020. You can put that on a podcast if you want. Ha! Today's topic is what other people are thinking about you. Now, when you saw that, if you saw that, did it feel slightly confronting? Like, oh my God, she's going to tell me what other people are thinking about me. It may have, even though it doesn't make a ton of sense, because we have an incredibly sensitive response to the thought of what other people are thinking about us. In fact, I saw somebody online the other day that said, um, we, we can't even think a thought without thinking about what other people are thinking about our thinking that thought. <laughs> and I really felt this yesterday because I got my hair cut. Like, I like it. I kind of like it. Um, so I got my hair cut and I went in and the, the cutter of my hair put the, the thing around my neck. And she said, so what's new? Since the last time she cut my hair and I was like, I don't know. We got a new president, I said, and she went, eh? and I was like, oh my goodness, she's one of the people who believes it's not a real election and it's contested and everything. And guys, if you feel that way, I still love you, but I just don't believe that. I do not think it was a rigged election. And I do think we have a new president elect. And so I sat there in the chair with this terrible fear that she was going to do something ungodly to my haircut just in revenge for the election and i i got so then i spent the whole day like tied up in knots worried about what my hairstylist is thinking about my political position even though she didn't say anything so this got me thinking about how obsessed we are about what other people think of us and how it is actually driving a huge amount of anxiety and depression in like public life. Uh, the Atlantic just put out an article saying that adolescents are committing suicide at higher rates. Suicide has risen to the second leading cause of death among adolescents and young adults, second only to accidents. And one of the reasons they think this is happening is that people are so exposed to criticism and sometimes bullying and mockery online. So they're getting much, much more exposure to what people are thinking about them in the, the relatively inaccessible realm of the internet. So people can say things about you online that they wouldn't say to your, to your face. So, and then, I mean, I stopped my eye issues. Um, but people are getting so worried about what other people are thinking about them that they're actually killing themselves at much higher rates than before. And it's not, it's the weird mood in the country. You know, like I've, I saw signs on different people's lawns coming up to the election and one would have a Biden sign and one would have a Trump sign. And you could like feel the crackle of hostile energy <laughs> between these neighbors. I, I could have been imagining that, but it felt, it felt very contentious here in Pennsylvania where we, you know, the, it was right down to the wire with Pennsylvania. And so it was a, it, it was a real hot spot, and there was a lot of disagreement. And let me tell you, the feeling of people disapproving of each other was actually, I think, physically tangible. Like leading up to the election, I could feel in the air, and especially through the days 
after the first night of the election and then they were counting votes for two or three days the energy in the air was like crackling it was it was like charged with electricity and either it was coming from me alone or i was picking up what was actually there either way i was feeling what other people were thinking about each other now I happen to know a little bit about the social science of why we're so obsessed with what other people are thinking of us. Even in baboon troops, if one baboon feels like ousted by another, like so two baboons have a fight and the troop sides with one of them and not with the other, the baboon who doesn't get sided with has massive spikes in cortisol, adrenaline, all the stress hormones and is likely to die prematurely of heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, and other degenerative illnesses. In other words, the baboons, I don't even know how they think about each other, but one baboon who knows that the troop doesn't think well of him is very vulnerable. And we're just about this far from baboons in evolutionary ter terms, so we're super susceptible. And then we get these media, especially during the pandemic, right, where we're always online and we're in that interesting non-environment um, where people can reach us in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. It takes that old evolutionary baboon social primate psychology and just does weird things with it, puts it on massive steroids, and it creates something called the spotlight effect. And this is something that psychologists have tested. When people go into a room, um, they, they have this great... <laughs> They had this great study where they took a bunch of um, just ordinary folks and most of the people would be conspiring with the researchers, right? So they knew that this was a testing situation. The researchers told everyone they were going to take a basic intelligence test or something, but they had to wear a certain shirt. They would give them all t-shirts and they gave one person a shirt that had a picture of a pop star who I probably shouldn't name. I'm not out here to make fun of anyone. But after I read the study, I was medically unable to stop humming Copacabana for like a week. I'm, I'm not saying who that was. But they put these poor people in a shirt with this man's face on it, assuming that it would be embarrassing to them. And it, it usually was. And then after they took their fake intelligence test, they all filled out a questionnaire that asked them how much attention the other people in the experiment had paid to them. So people who were not wearing a pop star t-shirt gauged it about accurately. You know, they thought people were paying attention to him to a certain degree, and it pretty much matched what the researchers saw. But the people with the embarrassing shirt overestimated the attention they would get by a pretty regular 50%. Like people spent 50%. Uh, they were thinking that people were thinking about them 50% more than the people were actually thinking about them. Social science research is very hard to just sum up. You have to sort of read the papers. Anyway, the spotlight effect named after this experiment is when we are in a particularly vulnerable space and we think that we're being watched. And we think that we're being watched by people who have negative viewpoints about us for one reason or another. And we can get like those baboons who are being bullied, we can get caught up in angst and anxiety and apparently even suicidal ideation from some people. I remember one time I went to a restaurant with some friends and one of the dishes on the menu was uh, French fries fried potato, and it was fried in duck fat, which I'd never heard of doing. But instead, they'd made a typo on the menu, and it said the fries were um, made in duck facts, facts about ducks. So I took a picture of it, and I put it up on Instagram with a list of duck facts, because ducks are really fascinating. They can change gender at any stage of their life, and did you know that? Yes, they can. The, the males have a deciduous thingy that falls off once a year, and they have to grow it back. So I put, <laughs> I put all these duck facts that I thought were awesome down on my Instagram, along with this picture of the menu. If you were one of the people who got mad at me, 
I, I just want to apologize for speaking of duck, duck facts online without sufficiently expressing my regret that people eat ducks. I'm really, I did not eat them myself, but that I eat chicken. I'm not going to say any other way. But I almost got scared right off the internet by how angry people were at me for my duck facts post. And, you know, I'm somebody who's supposed to be willing to like stand up in, a, in public and handle it. It's not easy to handle. So I was very excited when I read kind of a fix for the spotlight effect in a book by Mario Martinez. I quoted him before. He's a He's a sociological anthropologist and a medical doctor. He's like, he's a whiz bang genius. And he wrote a book called The Mind Body Code, where he talks about the effects that our emotions and our social interactions have on our physical health. And he talks a lot about cultural shaming and how shaming from people around us can be incredibly toxic to our bodies. And here's the thing, unless you don't go online at all, unless you just don't dip your toe in those waters, these days you're going to see people screaming, if not at you, then at people who think the same thoughts that you think. And then you'll walk through the day thinking your thoughts and then thinking about what other people are thinking about the thoughts you're thinking. And it can ruin your whole life. So I'm going to tell you Mario Martinez's exercise and we can all do it together. And it has everything to do with my whole search for integrity. And in fact, I put it in my um, book, The Way of Integrity, which is coming out in April. And it's what happens when you start to diverge from the culture you're in. So it could be your family does things a certain way. It could be your religion or your ethnicity do things certain ways. And you decide that those ways aren't ideal for you. They don't, it doesn't serve your truth, your integrity to follow the, the cultural norm. So you break away and you do something that's more true for you. And immediately people start thinking bad thoughts about the thoughts you're thinking. And it's real. I mean, we can joke about like there's the 20, 40, 60 rule, which I've probably told you a million times. When you're 20, you're obsessed with what everybody's thinking about you. When you're 40, you stop thinking so much about what people are thinking about you. And when you're 60, you realize no one was ever thinking about you. But actually, they kind of were. That's what, um, that's what the statistics on increasing anxiety and depression and suicide related to internet shaming. There are people thinking bad thoughts about what you're thinking. I don't know what my hairstylist was thinking, but maybe it was really negative. I don't know. But whatever she was thinking, it got me off my center. So I spent the day worrying about someone else's thoughts about me and what people, what other people think of us is none of our business. That's got to be an ironclad rule for us in the 21st century. What other people think of me is none of my business. My business is to get in my integrity and stay there. And when I feel frightened of other people's thoughts about me, to work it in here until it's okay with me that they have divergent thoughts. Otherwise, I become somebody pressuring them to come to my way of thinking. And that's not what I want. I want acceptance for everyone. So here's the exercise from Mario Martinez. First of all, think of a difficult social group for you. So maybe you're going home for Thanksgiving to the family and that's always a little fraught with you for you. Or there's a group of friends that um, you don't quite agree with anymore, but you're scared they'll judge you. Um, maybe it's in your partnership, your romantic relationship. You're starting to diverge and you're afraid of getting the silent treatment if you say what's true for you. It could be anything. Go to a culturally uncomfortable place for you where you don't quite fit in. Imagine being there and drop all the muscle armoring that happens. Relax and feel the discomfort. Feel what one friend of mine calls the transformational tension. The tension that ha happens when you start thinking differently from the people around you and they don't, they think about what you're thinking in a negative way. Feel that in your body, feel it in your emotions. Okay. Now imagine going to a place where two things have happened. One is you have drunk a potion that only allows you to think the truth for yourself. 
it, you can only think what's true for you and you don't doubt it really you just accept that that's true for you the other thing that's happened is everyone else has drunk a potion so that they completely and totally support you as long as what you're saying is really true for you and they're absolutely supportive now imagine saying here's what i've been thinking you put out the thoughts that you're scared of people judging and everyone says, well, that's wonderful. I love that you went there. Way to go. That's making me think twice. Excellent. You just feel what that would be like in your body, in your emotions. Now, what Mario Martinez has us do is think of this as two fields of energy, one that's tribal shaming and one that is complete acceptance and move back and forth between them in your mind. So you go back into the judgmental situation and you go back into the situation where you're totally supported, back into judgment, back into support. And you actually lean forward a little into the support and back away a little away from the judgment and your body, he says, and I've found it true, starts to process what it would be like to be free what it would be like to live in truth without fear of other people's judgment. And just going back and forth is so reinforcing to the body that it's like an animal. If you train a dog by giving it a treat, it will repeat its behaviors. So when you have the feeling of being accepted, it's so delicious that it starts to condition the body to literally move towards situations that are safe and to literally get distance from situations that aren't. And that's the whole exercise. You just keep rocking back and forth and slowly, slowly, what happens is you detach from the group think that is attacking you and you move into freedom and you may encounter conflict, but you will also encounter support. It's almost like that, you know, the secret thing by thinking about getting support, you can, you prime yourself to actually get support. So that's what I wanted to say about today. It's a useful little exercise for a time when everything is still very fraught. The whole, um, the election is still being contested by some and, um, times are weird. Times are weird folks, but try that exercise and it might help. Okay. Questions. Yay. Anne says personally, the, it, if the division of hate that has been ample, it's the division, I think it means it's personally, it's the division of hate that has been amplified so much. How do we begin to respect and have a reasonable level of trust for others? You, you really have to start by getting very solid in your own integrity. The moment you become susceptible to, you start changing what you believe because you feel the onslaught of other people's opinions, you've left your integrity. Now, having left your integrity, it's just like it says in the Bible, you, you're no longer based on a rock. You're based on sand, other people's opinions, your integrity. You have to like go by yourself and think through very clearly what's true for me. And then do this exercise where you imagine being accepted. And then when you find people who are not accepting you, oddly enough, it won't make you more vulnerable. It will make you get distance because the appropriate way to deal with that kind of conflict is to set boundaries, emotional boundaries, interpersonal boundaries. As Brene Brown's research shows, people can have incredible compassion for others as long as they have very high boundaries and you get to be completely yourself. And if anything starts to push you off yourself, that's the signal that you're leaving your integrity and you have to go again, go alone, get back into it and then go out in the world again. And as you do that, you get solid and the truth has legs as my late friend Brea would always say at the end of the day, it's the only thing left standing. So when you go back to your truth, back to your truth, back to your truth, at the end of the day, that's the only thing left standing and all the criticism that you attract will just, it, it won't affect you. It will end up, and it'll, you know, it'll make an impression, but it can't last because it's not about truth and a true thing lasts where a false thing falls apart because it's not real. In Buddhism, they just say it's Maya, it's illusion. So, um, let's see the, the, the print on my computer is, oh, this is much better. Okay. So Jen says, Martha, would you say support doesn't mean agree with so family, et cetera, can support each other, even when they disagree. You know what? Um, 
Yes, and um, right now, and increasingly, I think, the, the mood has become so toxic that when people disagree, there's almost a statement that you have to be against someone. Like, if, if you're not for us, you're against it, us. So it's created this kind of antagonistic energy, and you kind of do have to choose a side because this, the sides won't allow there to be an in-between. So to support you as a person and to love you with whatever your opinions and spiritual experiences and political ideals are, yeah, you can get that, but you also need the company of people who are of like mind. And that means people who can think through issues in similar ways. Ugh, it's a really awkward thing even for me to talk about it because I would love there to be a position that accepts everybody unconditionally. And I think there is, you can accept everybody unconditionally. Then, but you get caught in this paradox where you have to accept people who don't accept. Unconditional acceptance involves everyone, including people who are intolerant. And that's really, it feels really strange. It feels like the tolerant side is always going to get wounded because intolerance comes with anger and hatred. And then tolerance is just sitting there going, well, okay, it's all right with me. But I actually think that this is why Jesus said, turn the other cheek in the Bible, because when you are absolutely in line with your integrity and you are genuinely loving to another person, it's very, very difficult for them to hold an energy of conflict. If you won't go into it, it's almost like because you're in the truth, you've got a heavier anchor than they do. So that all the conflict, the conflicted side will be pushed away from the side that seeks harmony because in the end, nature seeks harmony, spirit seeks harmony, the heart seeks harmony. So if you're in a place of harmony, you, you may take a few hits, but you'll find yourself going away from the places where you've taken those hits and sort of manifesting in a very secret way, the secret way, people of like mind. And that can happen on the internet as easily as cyberbullying can. And it can be a source of connection, a source of sharing. It's where I think we can communicate our own transformation of consciousness. As we become more enlightened, we can seek places where that's what's being supported. And the energy of that, supposedly when people go and meditate, they do these um, meditation like festivals in cities. And supposedly, according to research that's impossible to really verify, the crime rate in those cities goes, goes down dramatically. And these, these statistics do exist. It's just impossible to totally assign causality. But these people go around having meditation festivals. And in the places where they're putting themselves in harmony, there's much, much less crime while that's happening. There's a field, there's an energy field state that goes with internal integrity and harmony that is incredibly powerful. And I, I guess that's what I'm trying to tell you all. Rest on that. Grab it with both hands. Don't leave it. Don't ever leave it because you're afraid of what somebody's thinking about you. Stay in your integrity and you become a source of peace, even when things are really badly contested. So, um, oh, Emily said, if there was one book to read prior to the way of integrity, what comes to mind? Mm, Black Beauty? No, um, that's about a horse. It was one of my favorite books as a child. Um, no, I would say my favorite book, The Tao Te Ching. I always tell people to read The Tao Te Ching. Um, and if you want to read The Divine Comedy, the whole book is based on The Divine Comedy. But hey, I wrote it so you wouldn't have to read The Divine Comedy. Uh, I just say, forget reading. Sit in a room by yourself and find the truth in your own heart. And that will set you up to really follow this book, which is meant to be your companion all the way to enlightenment. Um, that's why I use Dante. I haven't gotten that far yet, but I think he did. So thank you for that lovely question. Um, Delian says, what are the best tools you would suggest for creating boundaries with love? So glad you asked. There's one that a, a therapist I know calls the broken record. And it's really simple. If you repeat a boundary three times, there's actually something in the brain 
that if you do something more than three times, the brain just goes, all right. So if what you do is you say something like, I would like you please not to talk about politics at dinner. And then they bring it up again. So you say, um, I would like you please not to talk about politics at dinner. And then it if it happens four times, it clocks. People start to just follow it. And I had a really interesting experience with uh, when I was in therapy once. I had a very negative thought about myself, like I suck or something. And we were, we were the therapist was talking to me about all these wounded parts of myself and everything. And then she said, okay, that just has to go. Tell it to leave. And I was like, but I can't, I think I'm, I'm emotionally scarred. And she's like, no, it's gotta leave, it's gotta leave. And I was like, but I can't just, she's like, it has to go away, go away. <laughs> And it did, <laughs> it just went away. If you repeat something four times with love and clarity, people start to connect. And if they won't do that, you're gonna start pulling back and interacting with them less, which is a geographic boundary. So think of your, your whole life as a target. This is what they used to teach um, boundaries to my son, Adam, who has Down syndrome, when he was a little kid, they put all these kids in the middle of a big tarp that had like a target on it. And in the center of the bullseye would stand the child. And then people would pretend to be different types of person and they would walk toward the child. And when the child said, stop, they would stop right there. And if somebody was pretending to be sneaky or gross, the child would stop them before they even got on the target. And then if people were like a teacher had come into the third from the bullseye and then they say, stop, that's intimate enough for me. And people with different psychological conditions had different boundaries. And it was so interesting to, for, to me to see that these kids, some of whom were not even verbal, they knew exactly when the energy coming toward them was not meant to be in their space. And they would stop, they would say stop. And they all learned that. And I started using that myself. And I started teaching clients to use it. And it's really helpful because we generally are primed to let people come very close to us as long as they're being nice, even if we're really scared, even if we really don't feel good about it. And we do it to our own detriment. And it's our responsibility to keep those boundaries. So yeah, say what you believe firmly, kindly, see if you, and then just be a broken record. And don't even vary it. Don't say, I've told you a million times, just say it over and over and then they'll grok it. Okay. Um, Catherine says, is not engaging in conflicts on social media a, a cop out or a valid form of self-protection? I still feel bad that some friends disagree with me. Yeah, this is why I keep saying integrity, integrity, integrity. The only thing that can really teach you exactly where to put your boundaries and exactly how far to go swimming in these waters is your inner, I call it the sense of truth. And it's exactly what the kids felt when they said, stop right there. So if you feel like you really have to talk about duck facts and you hold back, you'll lose your integrity. You'll feel a loss. <laughs> I certainly do. I have so many more duck facts that I don't dare relate. Um, but when somebody comes too close, you'll feel like, oh no, I'm not meant to go there. I'm meant to like shut my computer, go in the other room, have a cup of tea and read the Tao Te Ching or the Divine Comedy. And only you can say what, what's a cop out and what isn't. So Donna says, I worried about what others thought of me. It was worried about what others thought of me that motivated me to do many positive things like work on my fear of worrying what others thought about it. How do we find that balance between obsessive worry that is helpful and freedom to be in integrity in the moment? What I think Donna is that the people who were influencing you were agreeing with your inner self. So there was a part of you that was resistant, but the reason, because we're getting, we're all getting pushed all the, over the place, right? Different directions. And the fact that you responded to some of the people means that that chimed the sense of truth in you and you went toward it. And if you feel that every time we go toward our truth, there's this sense of oh, like, oh yeah, calm, like a, a click, like a puzzle piece fitting in. And our true selves are always trying to break through our conditioning to tell us what's true. Okay, let's see, there are a few other questions, but we're really at the time limit. 
Uh, so let me see. Um, mm -mm -mm. Alicia says, would this being with more like-minded people not promote more of the bubbles we live in and therefore less communication? Yeah, that's a, that's a real argument for, uh, for being more sort of Catholic, in, not the religious Catholic, but the adjective Catholic in going about and participating in many things. But what I think is once you have a, a group that where you feel safe, it helps you get firmly established in your own integrity. And then you, like, like the great people who started the civil rights movement, they had to be able, and I've talked to black friends about this since the Black Lives Matter movement started. They have to be able to go just be with people who aren't racist for a while, be with their families, be with other black people. And then they get that really, they can go to that really strong, powerful social justice that is not violent, but never gives in. And they can take that out into a white dominated world and be brave. So yeah, there is the part where you have to be brave. Today, I just wanted to talk about the part where you get set in your integrity and stop having to be in fear. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, somebody says, I wanna hear more, more dark facts. Oh, so many. Okay, the male, the thing that falls off, it's corkscrewed one direction and the female duck has a thing that corkscrews the other direction, which makes mating incredibly difficult. And if the duck, if a female duck doesn't like it, she can put the sperm off to the side and not let it fertilize her eggs. Yes. So you can see how deeply my passion for duck facts is, is pushing me to get past my fear of social conditioning and backlash and if you, if you are angry with me about my duck facts, please don't even get in touch with me. I, I can't handle it. No, I love you guys. And I hope that as we go forward and then there might be some more contention about the election and whatever, just get in your integrity, get with your peeps, then go stand up for justice in whatever way feels right to you. I love you. I love you. I'll see you next week on The Gathering Room. Mwah, mwah, mwah.